over 700 applications were received from all over Kenya, and from these, 350 contestants were shortlisted. After a series of auditions, over 50 women were selected, and they will now battle it out at the Academy for the coveted title of Miss President. They say, East, West, Home's Best. And if you're watching KTN Home, you're watching Miss President, coming to you live from Catholic University of Eastern Africa here in Nairobi, Kenya. Now, the top six are in the mix. You have Nuru, Bina, Pauline, Milka, Angel, and Frida. They are going to be the contestants vying for the Miss President. Welcome to the great debate. Now the power, the future, is actually in your hands because you have the choice to make who's going to be the next Miss President season two. And we are here with very distinguished guests. I mean, you're all distinguished guests, but some guests are more distinguished than others. And I would like to make a special mention of uh, Karen Hagerman, who is the Deputy EU Ambassador and Deputy Head of Delegation, EU in Kenya. We also have Kimani Mungai, who is from the Canadian High Commission, Helen Mushunku from UN Women, Nerea Oketch from Miss President, uh, this was a season one winner. And also we have Honorable Irene Mayaka and Omolke Hassan, who are also from Miss President season one and are now part of the National Assembly of the Republic of Kenya. So, without any further ado, I would also like to introduce our special guests here, our judges, starting with Judge Zipio Koth, Judge Jerry Kirini, Judge Honorable Michael Nyango, and of course, our moderators, the lovely and very intelligent and very sharp and witty and brilliant Momanyi herself, Sean Momanyi, and Mr. Eric Latif, and of course, the impeccable Mr. Emmanuel Mashumbe. So without any further ado, because this is basically a ladies' night, ladies first, I would definitely hand over to a very special lady, Ms. Momani. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. And ladies and gentlemen, at this very moment, I'd like to invite to the stage the six finalists to come and take position at their resp respective podiums. And it's important to note that ahead of tonight's debate, the contestants balloted to identify their order of appearance on stage and also the order of fielding questions. And it is in that order that I welcome first on stage Pauline Ad Viambo Onguka from Siaya County. Pauline is, has worked rather as a director in the office of the Siaya governor and is the former immediate national chair of service delivery units of Siaya County. In addition to being a mother, she is a professional entrepreneur and a politician. Police, uh, Pauline is the founder and executive director of Motisha Adada, which is an organization that aims to motivate the youth and help them to uplift themselves. Next is Milka Riga from Taita Taveta County, who is a gender, governance and public policy specialist. She works for the County Assembly of Taita Taveta as head of research and policy analysis. Milka is passionate about bridging the socioeconomic gap among Kenyans. She is the founder of Taita Taveta Professional Women's Association, as well as Happy Children's CBO for Children's Protection. Through the CBO, Milka established the first community library in her local village, Landi, to enhance literacy and numeracy in her community. And Nairobi County is represented by Bina Maseno. Bina is the founder and executive director at Badili Africa. She uses her voice to champion for the inclusion of women and youth in decision making and governance. She is passionate about working with women and youth in urban informal settlements and institutions of higher learning. Bina is also a mentor, a trainer, a mother and a wife. Angel Mbudia is a certified public accountant from Kiambu County. She serves as a director in the Kenya National Youth Council Board and was recently elected to serve as a chairperson in the first ever Comesa Youth Advisory Panel. Angel is also the Secretary for Gender and International Relations in the All Africa Student Union headquartered in, Agra, in Accra, Ghana. Angel is an advocate for equitable, accessible and affordable education for all. Welcome Angel. From Kwale County is Nuru Mohammed, who is currently working as a chief officer in the Kwale County government. Nuru is committed to having an economy where no one is left behind through supporting creative economies, inclusion and empowerment. Nuru is keen on building resilient communities by designing, implementing and capacity building in water, environment, sanitation, land management and urban development programs. 
and the sixth finalist is Frida Karani from Embu County. Her passion for improved livelihoods, sustainable development and accountable governance led her to establish the Teach in Time My Africa project to mainstream children, youth, women and men for holistic development of society. She is a climate champion, a women and youth rights advocate, chair of the board of trustees for a youth organization and patron of Athletics Kenya, Embu County. Welcome ladies and let's debate. Now each one of you will be given one and a half minutes to answer the questions that we shall be fielding to you this evening. And should there be any opportunity where a contestant's question or response is mentioned adversely by another contestant, we shall use our discretion as moderators to give that contestant an extra one minute for rebuttal or right of reply. Of course, we'd like to remind you, just as you've done so far on the show, to observe and maintain decorum, treat with each other courteously, respond to each other courteously, allow each person to have their moment, to have their one and a half minutes to respond to their question, and you shall not interject, but let them respond. Let's debate. Right. And as we begin, we'll give each of you one minute to give your opening statements before we get into the questions. And we we'll want to begin with you, Pauline, your opening statement. At Independence, our founding fathers identified three key challenges, and that was poverty, illness, and illiteracy. 59 years later, the current leadership and Kenyans, we are asking ourselves, where are we? We can put a smile because we have made some strides. However, the question tonight is, are we where we'd want to be? For me as Miss President, I would say not yet. This night, I will be engaging with my worthy competitors to put forth questions, especially looking at homegrown solutions in this country that would be able to restore and brand Kenya, not only here, but also globally. The time has come, and my rallying call is, Mwana Inchin Yokusema, loosely translated in English, that the citizens have a say. So this night, I want to tell Kenyans that they have a say when it comes to issues concerning them. And that is why I am here this night. I am happy and excited too. Thank you. Thank you, Pauline. Milka, your 60 seconds for an opening statement. Thank you very much. The woman that you see here today, Milka Riga from Teta Taveta, has a career spanning eight years in public service. And over the last five years, I have not lived in a city, I have not lived in a town, but I have lived right at the heart of the rural areas, in a village where I have been able to understand the needs of the Mwananchi. Now I understand that being a president and being a leader is about policies, be it agriculture, be it foreign affairs, be it food policies and all that. I have been lucky to have been at the Hague Academy for Local Governance and to be taught about policy. And one thing that we need to get right as Kenya is the policies, first of all, need to be sustainable. And the second thing, the Mwananchi must always have a say in terms of citizen participation. And that is what drives me tonight and every day as a leader. I'm very glad to be here and I'm looking forward to this engagement. Thank you. Right. Bina, in 60 seconds, what should we know about you? Uh, I was born and uh, brought up in Kayole. And growing up, I lost three friends to crime. So I have seen firsthand the pain of a struggling mother having to bury their own child. And this fueled my passion for community development at a very tender age. At 22, for the first time, I was on the ballot for member of county assembly. And this gave me a rare opportunity of interacting with citizens and seeing firsthand how poverty strips us of our dignity. We are dealing with big challenges currently. Talk about the cost of living, talk about food insecurity, talk about limited access to employment opportunities in this country. As Miss President Bina Maseno, I believe I have what it takes to provide the leadership that is going to solve the challenges of our time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bina. Angel, 60 seconds. Tell us about yourself. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and our viewers back at home. I am truly, truly honored to be here. And as a young girl, I was brought up by my mother and encouraged to work hard, be disciplined, 
and have a lot of determination and that is what has led to my achievements up to this day. I am truly, truly honored to be graced with these brilliant women alongside me. And that is a Kenya we want, and that is a Kenya we need. I am particularly inspired by Mama Phoebe Asiyo and Wagari Madai, who have been at the forefront in championing national issues. They championed for issues even when we could not imagine that they would happen 20 years and 30 years later. So today we're even having the COP. We're even having the, the COP26 happening in Egypt. And now we have to keep really discussing environmental issues when she raised them 20 years later. So as I stand here, I am inspired by them. And I also remember our forefathers who fought for this nation. And as they fight for this nation, I am encouraged that they were young people. And as young people, we move forward with that energy and strength. Thank you. Thank you, Angel. Nuru, in 60 seconds, your opening statement. Thank you so much. My name is uh, Nuru, as you've heard. What my bio did not say is who Nuru is, actually. Those are just achievements on paper. I was born in a small village that nobody knows about called Denyenye. And by that time, my chances were very limited. But today, I can assure you, I've learned a lot first from the upbringing that I have. I'm lucky that my mother is in the crowd. She comes from Vihiga County, and my father comes from the coast. Through that experience, I've learned to appreciate diversity, which is some power that Kenya has that we are not able to fully explore. In front of you is a lady who has learned what it means to be humble. Humility, clarity, and confidence is what has brought this village girl this far. I'm standing here to represent a lot of Kenyan girls, and I can tell you for sure, what I'm bringing to the table is solutions that all of you can relate with. Today is an opportunity for me to bring some of those very easy relatable solutions in front of you for all Kenya to appreciate. Thank you. And finally, Frida from Embu, your 60 seconds. There are two narratives that we cannot take for granted today. One is when we talk about the last kicks of a dying horse. It was a funny statement long time, but today when you mention that statement, it represents the loss of livelihood for a big community in Kenya. The second statement that we cannot take for granted is that a stitch in time saves nine. The retirement age for a normal Kenyan is 60 years. Next year, Kenya will be 60. If it were a person, Kenya would be retiring. What would she be retiring to? So I think the time has come that we radically change the strategies that we take in Kenya from harnessing political power to harnessing social power, which is with the people, so that we are able to achieve the development that we want. And who are these people? These people are the children, the youth, the women, and even the men who for a long time have asked, where is our affirmative faction? I think it is time for that change, and I represent that change. I am glad to be engaging you tonight on that ideology. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much, ladies. We've gotten to know you. We've gotten to know what drives you. Let's now debate. And just to let you know, we'll be having questions drawn from different thematic areas. None of you has seen these questions. And uh, at this point, we'll begin this first session with food security. And I'll begin with you, Pauline. According to the UN outlook for October to November 2022, 4.4 million Kenyans are facing hunger. 1.2 million of this are in the emergency phase and need urgent support. Further, according to the National Drought Management Authority, there are 942,000 cases of children aged between 6 and 59 months who are acutely malnourished. And 134,000 cases of pregnant or lactating mothers who are also acutely malnourished. As president, mm. Pauline, how would you solve the food security challenge for Kenya once and for all? Kenyans, we are in a very, very tight state at this particular time. Statistics are good, but this night, I want us to relate these statistics and make them human beings. When we talk of 4.4 million Kenyans facing starvation, when we talk about malnutrition, as a president, that is a concern. And I think the first things first is to ensure that the Kenyans, wherever they are, that are hunger-stricken, get food. One of the areas is, do we have reserves? It is important for any president to have a reserve, a buffer, per adventure we are faced in such kind of a scenario. Food security starts from the household. 
The reason why I did mention Mwanaichi Ndiyo Kusema, there are days during my time that we had kitchen gardens. What happened to the kitchen gardens that today we cannot get Skuma Wiki just at the kitchen? What happened to the, to the extension workers who would come and tell us what to grow? It is time we stopped relying on, on rain-fed plants or rain-fed production. It is time if maize is not helping us because the rains are not coming, can we resort to other drought resistant crops like cassava? So I think for me as a president, is this is a table that needs a discussion. Bring everyone on board, the public sector, start from the county governments, go to the national governments, what do we have? But above all, have citizens suffering at any point. It's a paradox that Nyandarwa is having potatoes being thrown out, but Nyeri on the other side has no food. Why can't the counties coordinate? So I think that would be my take. Let's have a voice to discuss this. Thank you very much, Pauline. I'll come over to you, Milka. As president, not only the 4.4 million who are facing starvation today, but the entire population will be expecting you to give solutions on ending food insecurity once and for all. What would you do? Uh, thank you very much. Now, I feel very embarrassed that about three weeks ago, Ukraine, which is a country which has been in war over the last about two years, actually was supplying us with wheat. And now you understand that Kenya actually imports 95% of its wheat needs, 95% of its oil needs, over 50% of its maize needs, yet Kenya can't be able to do that uh, kind of famine and produce the food for themselves. So as a president, 98% of our agriculture is actually rain fed. Yet we have rains that come, yeah? So I'm surprised that we actually haven't been able to tap and to harvest this rainwater. So as president, first of all, I am going to introduce a rainwater harvesting fund where the Monanchi is going to access uh, loans uh, in a cheap way to be able to uh, put up gutters and tanks in their homes. And the other thing that I'm going to do is that there's a national cereal and produce board which actually has cereal um, reserves. I am going to make sure that every county has a replica of the same. The other thing is we need to demaze. Do you know that cassava is one of the most um, drought resistant crop? Do you know that, that it actually feeds more than half a billion people, even our neighbors in Central and, 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 and um, West of Africa? So there are many other things we could do, including research. We have Calri and Calro and many other ways. Uh, and of course, the issue of uh, mechanization and digitization. So that is what I will do to ensure that we don't have uh, food insecurity. Thank you. thank you. Thank you, Milka. And Bina, the same question. What would you di do different? We've seen, we've had perennial drought in parts of this country. Uh, the numbers that we see of children not, uh, you know, being malnourished and not getting the nutrition they need. What will be the final solution for the country? First of all, as Madam President, my heart goes out to all the Kenyans uh, who are starving and even for the lives that we've lost. Access to food is a basic right in this country, according to Article 43 of our Constitution. As uh, Madam President, number one, um, I'll address the factors of, I mean, I mean, the factors of food production when it comes to, when it comes to um, access to land, uh, labor, uh, capital, because food production in this country uh, is quite high, and that is why we can't even uh, export our goods. Like our goods cannot even compete with goods from uh, our neighboring uh, East African countries, like Uganda, like uh, like uh, Tanzania. And number two, uh, also addressing wastage. I think we've also sti seen statistics of how much we are losing in terms of corruption to projects that are meant to actually help us. Uh, move away from food insecurity. Look at the Galana Kulalu uh, project. We lost 5.9 billion. So as the president, I'll be keen to address uh, waste when it comes to um, corruption and uh, also to promote inter-county trade in this country. Because majority of us also, when you look at our, um, our farmers, we rely on subsistence farming. So look at uh, different counties. What are they good at? So if Nyandarwa can produce potatoes, can we then focus on that and invest more on producing potatoes in Nyandarwa? If Kinangop can produce cabbages. And lastly, also wastage, because our farmers are not able to have bargaining power because of wastage when it comes to storing food. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bina. Angel, the same question comes to you, and you're talking about what you need to do as president to ensure that this problem is solved once and for all. 
Uh, food insecurity in Kenya is very real. And at any one given time, we have about 4 million to 2 million Kenyans having nutritional deficiencies. And this is something we should not be discussing 69 years after independence. So when we look at food security, we need to look at it at a bro broader length. In 2003, Kenya ratified the Maputo Agreement on Food Security and Agriculture that really delegates states to commit about 10% of their budget allocation into sectors that really touch on agriculture. Kenya has done fairly well in this aspect. But then again, we need to ensure that that allocation goes to the purpose in which it is intended. And then now here is where we come to grapple with the monster of, of corruption. As Kenyans, I don't, as a country, I don't think we really leverage on the use of technology to ensure that we are able to have early warning systems because this is a day and age where we cannot rely on weather patterns and weather forecasting of the old ages to be able to tell what season is better for the other. I also think that as a country, we are not making use of the might and the brilliance of the youth who we can put in agriculture to be able to peddle and push the agricultural revolution that we really need to have that needs to be of the 21st century making. When we talk about land and finances and access to credit facilities being the major issues for the youth, I think that is something that as a country I would address as a president to ensure that there's so much land that you buy and keep as a saving. How can we as a state ensure that we lease it and ensure that someone else gets it and farms there? And then when we look at regional economic communities, we're not leveraging on COMESA, the common market for Eastern and Southern Africa, the East African community, to ensure that we import from them first before we go to import sugar and, and, and wheat from other countries. So let's leverage on that and we'll be able to see the benefits of it. Thank you. Right. Uh, thank you, Angel. Nuru, the same question to you. What would you do as president to ensure food security for all Kenyans and all the children of Kenya? Thank you so much for that question. Uh, I want to remind Kenyans that uh, 24 of our counties out of the 47 are in arid and semi-arid lands. We are talking about a population of more than 24 million people who do not, lack, do not have the opportunity to grow anything they desire. But look at it this way. Agriculture has offered a lot of opportunities. And thank God that agriculture is devolved. We can do indoor farms, especially in informal settlements. People can grow food even in container houses. And we've seen we, we are actually being prou proud of ourselves of having some of the biggest informal settlements in Kenya. But that's not something to be proud of if we cannot be able to sustain them where they are. Remember, this country is full of debt. We know the numbers. We are way above our abilities to borrow any more money to start investing in major infrastructure, in mechanization of agriculture. People are dying now and they want to see food on their table. Now with indoor farms we can grow more than 75% more food than we would grow in a normal farm. Remember also we have issues with our land tenure systems. People are not able to access arable land the same way they used to in the olden days because of a lot of loopholes in our land laws, which are reforms I will work on as president. But why would we do, we do that? Allow Kenyans to be able to grow food even in their houses. Controlled environments, food that is grown in indoor housing, is only able to use 10% of the water that you would require in total to be able to farm a normal farm out there. And I'm looking at it like, thank you so much. I think my point is home. Thank you. Yes, it is, Nuru. I want to come to you now, Frida. Same question. You say you are passionate for improved livelihoods, sustainable development, accountable governance. Now use that as passion and tell us what you do as president to ensure food security for Kenya. I would wish we broaden our mind about food security in two ways. There's food for human and there's food for animal. And luckily enough, animal is also food for human. So if we are able to address food for the two categories of animal kingdom, then we would go a long way in addressing food security. But first, let us ask ourselves, when did the rain be start beating us, if at all it is there? We interfered with the cycle with which the rain forms um, by the cutting of trees. What is causing uh, widespread cutting of trees in Kenya, for example. The real estate sector is, is growing at an alarming 60% per annum. So, but most of these uh, real estates, they are being put up in fertile areas where we should be having farmlands. So for me to sort out the issue of food security in Kenya, in the two aspects that I've talked about, one is I would develop the arid areas. For example, in Embu, we have the Mbere area. I would make it um, attractive for people to invest there so that they live in the arid areas and they leave the fertile areas for us to, to do farming. Then I would also propagate the growth of bamboo, which is a very versatile plant. There are some parts that are edible to the 
the human. Some parts are used to uh, provide fodder. Some parts are used for economic activities like producing toothpicks and producing furniture. And it's a crop that matures very fast, within three to four years. So those are the strategies that I would first adopt that are the low-lying fruits that would also be able to involve the people that I mentioned earlier uh, as I was making my opening statement as we leverage on social action. Right. Uh, thank you very much, Frida, and thank you very much, ladies. Uh, that brings us to the end of the first thematic areas of questions uh, on food security. And we want to get to the next uh, phase of questions. And this one is on public policy. Remember, you still have 90 seconds each to answer the question. I'll start with you, Angel. Period poverty is defined as a lack of access to menstrual products hygiene facilities, waste management, and education. It's a big challenge in Kenya. We've seen all these issues, like about one million Kenyan girls missing out on school each month because of this issue. So a very big uh, problem that we have in Kenya. If you were president of Kenya, how would you solve the problem of period poverty sustainably? All right, Sharon, first of all, my heart goes really out to all the girls I see having challenges with sanitary towels. But I think as a country, this is something that we can really counter because if we can do a standard gauge railway, railway ensuring that we have pads for girls in school and those even at home is something that we can comfortably do with our budget allocation. But then again, do we have leaders who believe that this is a priority when they are passing and allocating budgets for this? Because this is something that we must also do as Kenyans to ensure that as a civil society, we are able to mobilize ourselves to ensure that this is a priority issue. But then who is there to mobilize um, the, the civic society to ensure that this is an, an agenda on the table? Period poverty is something very sensitive in our society. When you talk about periods, it's something that I'm sure this is for, for, for maybe the fewest times we've talked about period poverty on national television because periods is something that we don't talk about in our societies. In our homes, a father doesn't talk to a, a daughter about periods. So how do we start talking about periods even when at the community level, at the, at the home, at the basic unit of the family, we are not able to have this conversation? When we, ha when we see our leaders not being able to pass a sex uh, rights and, educa and education uh, bill so that children are taught sex issues in school, education issues in school, because adolescence is real. We need to prepare them for this. We can tailor it in a way that allows them to be able to understand what is happening to their bodies and how they can take care of themselves. Because just having sex education in school ensures that a girl stays in school longer, that a, that a government prioritizes in it, and that a girl is able to even finish her tenure in school and ensure that the, that the boy or girl she gives birth to has a better life. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angel. I want to come to you, Nuru. You are committed to having an economy where no one is left behind. Just this month of November alone, just like last month of October, roughly one million Kenyan girls will miss out on school because they are unable to afford menstrual products. As president, what would you do to make sure that these one million girls are not left behind? As president, I'm a symbol of national unity, and part of it is ensuring that everybody accesses equal opportunities at whatever place they are, especially with education. And that is what we are trying to achieve by ensuring each of our kids share the same curriculum. But it's unfortunate that where we are standing right now, we are still talking about period poverty without understanding that first putting money, specific money in budgets every year might not be sustainable. We need to end this and end this entirely so that it is not a conversation we are supposed to have whether in parliament or anywhere in the county government. One way we can do that, we can start ensuring that investors come and, and produce pads that are recyclable for our communities to be able to use them en entirely. Communities should own up this project. I remember when we were having COVID and how the government made a very affirmative action of ensuring that masks are even produced locally. We can do that for sanitary towels. And we've seen even biodegradable ones being produced under the technological advancements that we're experiencing in the, in the world right now. These solutions should also allow for communities just the way we contribute our in our blood banks. Communities can have pad banks and be having movements to ensure that for those parents who are able to afford even 10 boxes of pads, one time when you're going to your school, ensure you, sub you, you supply also pads to assist the kids that do not have. When communities own this project, there'll be a total policy reform change that will make more impact than just talking about it amongst the few of us. Right, thank you, Nuru. And Bina. You are a champion for the inclusion of women in governance and leadership. 
Some girls will never stand that chance. If they can't make it to class, we know some, cla some girls have even committed suicide because of the shame that is associated with period poverty. What would you do as president to solve this problem? Uh, thank you. Um, as Madam President, I first of all want to acknowledge that there was a government program on uh, access to uh, sanitary towels that did not succeed, and uh, this was attributed to poor coordination. We had different government officials um, and uh, county officials wanting to manage uh, the project. As Madam President, um, I will compel uh, Parliament to legislate on having a budgetary allocation when it comes to CDF, when it comes to the kitty um, that uh, the members of Parliament actually manage, because if we can uh, give bursaries, I think we ought to and need to factor in um, access to sanitary towels if that alone is keeping a girl out of school. And uh, number two, we need to address the cultural and traditional norms that stigmatize women because of periods. Um, and uh, to do this, we also need uh, male allies when it comes to addressing uh, these cultural uh, norms that stigmatize girls and lead to examples that you've given, uh, like suicide, when a girl goes to school and they have their dress that is stained and boys are actually laughing at her. And uh, also, uh, lastly, we need to invest in local organizations' capacity to produce uh, and manufacture uh, sanitary towels so that we don't have to always um, depend on sanitary towels that we import. Thank you. Thank you, Vina. Frida, I come to you. Statistics show that about 10% of 15-year-old girls engage in transactional sex because mainly of menstrual poverty. As president, what would you do to address this issue? That is very true, and it is unfortunate because the conversation has been normalized in such a way that there are those who tell the girls, is periods your problem? Come, I show you how to solve it. And in the process of being shown how to solve it, they get pregnant, the, program looks, uh, the problem looks ended for like three months, and then we have a pregnancy to deal with. So for me, I think what I'll do is that I'll normalize the conversation about period poverty, so that now I'm even giving the ministries, department, agencies, and county governments a target to donate pads to the girls and also to hold co uh, conversation with the girls in schools. And that will be reported to my office through a relevant department. The other thing that I'll do is that I'll establish a national day. Kenya, we celebrate a lot of international days and a number of national days. I'll introduce a national day where the issues of the period poverty are addressed. And every county will be charged with the responsibility of having a scale-up event to that national day of what they particularly did on that day so that they are able to address the issue of period poverty. These people that are propagating the transactional sex, the ones that we know, the ones that we can name, we also need to talk to them so that we hold this conversation and hold responsibility for our girls. Because the girls that are mostly affected are the girls in school. But apparently, there are also women who are a bit el elderly, more than 18, 24, and above, who are also sometimes affected by um, the transactional uh, issue on, as far as the acquiring pads and the transactional sex is concerned, so that to address this issue. Right, thank you very much, uh, Frida. I want to come to you, Milka, and this falls right up your alley as gender and public policy specialist and currently head of research and policy in Taita Taveta County. So I want to imagine you've dealt with some of these things. As Miss President, what will you do different? How will this be solved, the problem of period poverty? Uh, thank you very much, Sharon. Like I said before about policy making, you cannot make policies on something you do not understand. Period poverty is basically the challenges that women and uh, girls go through to be able to actually manage their periods. Let's talk about how much they have to pay for the parts. Let's talk about how many uh, school days girls have to miss. The girls who miss four to five school days a month. Um, let's talk about their educational outcomes at the end of the day. Let's talk about women having to buy pads and having to forego other things. These are, these are all challenges. So what will I do? We have industries, the likes of Kikotek in K K Kitui. Are we able to, as we provide water, because you cannot do reusable pads without water, are we able to actually have industries in all counties actually managing this? The other thing is period, um, uh, period pads are not actually luxury goods. They are zero rated, as it is said. But when uh, one packet of pads, of eight pads, has to cost 50 shillings, 50 Kenya shillings, that is still too much. Will I buy pads or 
Will I buy food? So I think we need to consider increasing the budgetary allocation, which I think around right now it's about 400 million uh, for the school uh, distribution program. I think it's not enough. So I would consider actually increasing that, probably doubling it. And then look at the women who are not in school. How are they able to get uh, their pads and things like that? And the other thing that I would do is uh, distribution. Who distributes? Is it NGAF? Is it the, the, the schools? Is it the social services? So we need to work on the distribution chan channels to ensure that it is done in a better way so that they reach all the women who are actually needy. Thank you. Thank you, Milka. The f question, of course, comes to you, Pauline, lastly. You have experience in public service. You've worked in county government. If you're elevated to become president of the Republic of Kenya, how would you address the issue of period poverty to ensure that no girl is left behind? Fortunate that we are talking about period poverty during this century. Two questions that beg. So much has been done. We have statistics of organizations that have tried. We have a program my co-president here did mention that came on 2017. Kenyans, we are used to having policies. But who follows up that they implemented? So many good policies are on our shelves. I'm happy that the president did mention during the swearing in to the cabinet secretaries that there is no sleeping time. My first proposal, CS for gender, should have in her performance contract. This policy on uh, this program of 2017 should be legislated and we have it practicable so that we are able to track. Number two, I see some of my very good powerful ladies here. One of the things that I ask people in this room, how many of us have supported any girl next door with a single sanitary pad? Kenyans, I still talk about homegrown solution. At the household level, the girl next to you is not going to school. I think it is time that we started even adapting a school. We don't need to wait until all the girls are not in school, and then we come up with very good solutions. The last but not least that I need to talk about, it is possible to have an industry here in Kenya that is actually dealing with the issues of pads. If we have done it before, nothing should stop us. I think it is time we as Kenyans engage ourselves the budgets that are at the county government, this should be a priority. We shouldn't be feeling sorry. We should actually be on action oriented. Go out as a Kenyan, support a girl. That is number one. Adapt a school. Number two, the policy makers, let's have these ones implemented and tracked. If we can do this, then all of us are actually doing Kenyans a disservice. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, ladies. Now we go to the third uh, segment of our questions this evening. And this one will come from the audience. Our core moderator, Imano Moshumbe has them ready and those questions will be uh, asked from uh, the audience directed to you will be telling you which of you will be answering each of those questions after he finishes uh, asking the question then we'll uh, tell you to respond and we'll go on in that order the way we've done Bilashaka, thank you very much eric latif na vile vile pia sharon bomani kwa kazi nzuri ambayo inaendelea na vile vile pia wale waheshimiwa kwa pale mbele kwa kujibu maswali yenu. Maswali yametoka kutoka kwa uh, moderators ambao kwa pale mbele lakini kwa hivi sasa pia tutapata nafasi kwa wale jamaa ambao wako katika ukumbi hapa hivi kuweza kuuliza maswali yenu. Itakuwa ni rahisi tutachukua swali moja alafu tunalipitisha kwa Eric Latif pale vile na Karen Bomanyi kuweza kuwapatia nafasi wale waheshimiwa ambao wako pale mbele kuweza kujibu. Upande huu na nane ambao tutapatia nafasi Thank you very much. Kwa microphone yako, uliza swali lako kwa raka raka. Make it short, please. The question is, if you are the president, what would you do to ensure the cost of living is manageable and that more families can put food on their table today? How will you finance the plan as the president? Thank you. All right. Swali li maulizo hilo. Kazi kwako Eric Latif na Karen Bomanyi tuone waheshimiwa watakuwa na lijibu namna gani kabla nichukue swali lingine tena katika ukumbi. Right, asante sana mwashumbe. Swali lile la cost of living, uh, we all are living in this reality right now. Uh, if you are president, what would you do to make it easier for Kenyans? And I want to start with you, Nuru, on this question. Asante sana. Nimefurahi mwashumbe ameleta lugha ya Kiswahili, lugha ambayo najifariji kuitumia na Katika hali ya maisha, hali ya maisha inawezekana pale ambapo tunaweza kuwa na uchumi. Kwa sababu tukiongelea kuhusu hali ya maisha, aidha tuweze kupandisha uwezo wa wananchi kuwa na fedha ya kuweza kununua vile vitu wanavovihitaji, ama tuweze kushukisha bei ya vitu muhimu wanavovihitaji ili waweze kuvitumia. What I'm saying is the cost of living can either be as a result of us ensuring that the communities have the purchasing power for the products that they need, or have the ability 
to, or us, we have the ability to reduce those costs for the basic items so that they can be able to afford them. And I've come up with several solutions because I've realized there are some economic opportunities we've not fully explored. The creative economy controls a global revenue of 98.5 trillion. We've not explored that fact. We also have the economy that is controlled by the artifacts and the art and sculpture, which controls 1.7 trillion. We know so many communities here are cultured, and the culture is allowing them to be able to make very unique items that are capable of entering the global market. We are not doing enough to ensure that we create the platform for business for our communities without having to even look for new skills for people to be able to sell their products and start teaching them what they need to do because they already know what to do. Where I'll get the money is from government savings. We have too many public holidays we are celebrating. We can make budget cuts. We can survive without some of these holidays and save that money to save our communities. Thank you, Nero. Angel, same question. What would you do to ensure the cost of living is manageable? What's the plan? How would you finance that plan? Well, the cost of living, Eric, in this country is basically pegged on the cost of production of things. And one thing I'd really address as a president is to look into the issues to do with green energy. That's a, an aspect we are not focusing on as a country because we are relying on the fuel that we do not mine here in this country. So it makes everything go up when there's a problem somewhere in the world where we have those, uh, where we have those wells that we mine fuel for, for oil from. Then we're looking at manufacturing and industrialization. That is something that is steadily growing in Kenya and we really need to encourage that sector because once we encourage that sector, we'll be able to create more jobs and when we create more jobs, we increase the levels of, the levels of income of our people so they're able to put foods, food on their table. Then the other aspect is on technology. I think Kenya and even the government of Kenya today, maybe it would be silent when I say this, but they've not even started taxing online revenue or, or income generated online. That is a platform that I think we need to expand as a, as a country so that we have more revenue collected from that space so that we are able to even finance all these other aspects of, of, um, of, of, of our households, if it is food, if it is shelter, if it is education. I think there is more to be done in this country in those areas so that we are able to boost our economy. And then again, when we look at... Uh, when you look at Kenya as a financial service hub, it is one country in the Eastern Africa and one of the top in Africa. So it can, we can use that as a leverage so that we attract investors, a financial service hub, and that is one thing we can mine our revenue from. So we have so many opportunities. We are looking at the traditional ones, agriculture, tourism. We need to look away from that and get into the 21st century of, of right. the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Angel. Uh, Pauline, the same question to you. As president, Kenyans are looking to you. They can't afford unga ugali. They can't afford bread. How will you address this sustainably, practically? Such, such a sad scenario, but of course, as a president, Article 133 has given you that authority, so you have to take responsibility. I look at it from long term and short term. Short term, I did mention when I started, let no Kenyan die. One death is far too much for us. So first thing is we look at our budget. We can, re, as a government official, I know we can look at our budget, we can do validation, we can realign them. If we feel that we do not have a certain budget that we can set aside at the moment, we can see w which budget we can reduce. Is it on the roads? Because what is our priority? Having the roads and Kenyans are dying, that's a no for me. Number two, in terms of looking at, at the long term, I think it is time that we agree that our farmers um, are trying to produce, but we are a consuming nation. The drivers of economy are production, consumption, and investment. We are not investing because we are indebted. But again, we are consuming, but not producing. So I think I look at our farmers, how do we support them so that they produce more? Because when they produce more, we are able to consume and have the excesses. So for me as a president, the reason why I keep saying there has to be a discussion, because the county government run budget, the national governments run budgets. We have the regional economic blocks, Jumuya, Ya Coast, Yapwani. They come together as, as, as the counties in that region, the Lake Region Economic Block. Can these counties start discussions so that the Jandarua County that has potatoes can coordinate with the next county, with, which is Nyeri? For the first time in history, Nyeri is, uh, is, is relying on relief food. So these discussions, I think, for me as a president, would be very, very important. But above all, is to relook at our budget. And then, of course, the issue of fuel subsidy has been uh, something that is on, we can again look at that. Thank you very much, Pauline. And I'm glad you've gone into the issue of how to finance this. Milka, coming to you, what is your plan and how would you finance it? Thank you, Latif. As a president, I am not going to lead a dead nation or a sick nation 
Because remember, the high cost of living is going to lead to disease because of lack of food, because of lack of access to uh, basic um, you know, uh, services. And at the same time, it's going to lead to insecurity. I have to steal. Research has actually shown that uh, crime in Kenya is actually at a very high rate because of um, uh, inequalities. So the high cost of living, of course, I'm thinking there has to be temporary, then there has to be long-term measures. For temporary measures, I am going to give relief food to Kenyans. If it's not relief food in terms of distribution and the challenges that come with it, then I would offer unconditional cash transfers. How will I do this? We have an emergency fund which we can actually unlock and activate for use as of now. The other thing that I would do is actually uh, the reduction of government spending. I know uh, from Taita Taveta I enjoy coming up to Nairobi with the SGR, but how many people in Kenya, for example, benefit from the SGR as compared to how many people are experiencing, are not able to buy what they were able to buy uh, with 100 bob yesterday, today. So inflation is at 8% right now. The other thing I would do is to try and re uh, uh, renegotiate uh, the debt uh, payment, you know, uh, arrangements. Right now, Kenya is actually drowning in debt. Are we able to actually postpone some of the dates? And the last thing that I would do is basically try to ensure that we produce more food, uh, we produce more, uh, um, you know, um, of our own commodities through industrialization. Thank you. Right. Uh, thank you very much, Milka. And the same question to you, Frida. What would you do? How would you finance your plan? The cost of living becomes unmanageable when the money in my pocket cannot afford the basic needs that I need. So it is possible to have a high cost of good, but people can afford. So for me, my strategy uh, would focus on first empowering the people to have money in the pocket. But that is long term. What I'll do in the short term is that we know fuel is one of the key drivers of the rise in uh, cost of living because fuel is very key in producing different goods and services. In Kenya, the fuel pump that you pay or the fuel price that you pay at the pump carries about 12 levies. Some of these levies are just pronunciations in parliament. So as president, some of these pronunciations that are very high, like 25% uh, railway maintenance levy, I would drop it to 12%. So how would I fund this? We have 47 counties in Kenya. We celebrate four national holidays. Just go to a field and make speeches and maybe some eating. And on average, we could spend 10 million. Some counties spend more than 10 million. And that comes to a whooping 1.88 billion shillings. I believe 1.8 billion shillings is enough money to give a moratorium, even if it's for a month or two, depending on how our economy is, so that the fuel price goes down. The other strategy that I would use is really to encourage the eating of foods that are available in season. Like, for example, you could have fruit trees in primary schools where children can just eat a mango or a pear or an avocado as they pass by, and that reduces their demand for food. Thank you. Bina, take the question as well. Um, as Madam President, I'm very much aware that we cannot talk about reducing the cost of living if we are not discussing the cost of food production in this country because, of, because the cost of food production is what drives the high cost of living from producing food to transporting food to now access to markets for our farmers. Agriculture and uh, the service industry are the biggest contributor to our GDP and the biggest employer as well. Yet our farmers are the poorest. How are we able to add value to the products that we produce, to the food that we produce, so that our goods can be able to compete outside our borders and put more money in the pockets of our farmers. Number two, I think leveraging on uh, technology. Uh, we've seen how also energy, electricity, drives the high cost of food production in this country. We have diaper technology that, that has been tested actually uh, in Japan in terms of producing energy by recycling diapers and the people who actually take the diapers are paid something small so it also helps in terms of environmental management because diaper pads plastics take so much time to decompose and contribute to the land issue that we are seeing uh, in this country also uh, streamlining the informal sector and collecting revenue from the informal sector the juakali uh, sector and lastly incentivizing young people to join agriculture by ensuring that government can lease land to young people to be able to farm because majority of them do not have access to collateral that can enable them access land to farm thank you very much 
Nam, thank you very much, Bina. Of course, that is the round of questions that uh, was fielded from the audience. Um, Pauline, yes? I, I think Bina has brought in something that I just wanted to, to mention. Uh, she she has mentioned about uh, making agriculture friendly to the youth. And I think most of the youths are here. It is time that uh, the youths embraced agriculture. So I think the challenge we, we are putting on leaders is how do we make it friendly even in schools? During my time, we had the 4K clubs and it was exciting. So ICT should come on board so that after they do that, I think what the youths feel is maybe it's dirty work, but as you realize, this is what will drive our economy. So I think it is time that this should actually be taken up. Thank you. Right. Uh, I'll allow 30 seconds for response to that. Yes, okay. Later. Uh, thank you very much. I think I'd like to also pose a question to Ms. President Bina. Uh, and she's talked about collecting taxes from the informal sector. And uh, my concern is that we are actually talking about the cost of living. And the people who are actually affected by the cost of living are these same people who are in the informal sector. So now if you want to collect more taxes, is this on the long term or on the short term? Because if someone is already drowning and then you want to now push them more into the ocean, then how does that work? So I would like to understand that. OK. Uh, I think, Bina, you can answer that before we go on break. Uh, thank you so much, uh, President Trigger. Uh, I think I was addressing the question in terms of uh, revenue collection. We know we have a huge debt crisis uh, in this country, and we've already hit our ceiling. And we need to raise money internally. And half the time in the Jua Kali sector, I work in the informal settlement. I think people know me for my work when it comes to working with even women in Chamas, right? People in Chamas. And most of these businesses are not registered. And if they're not registered, meaning they're not able to contribute tax, tax that can then help spur economic growth, tax that, that, that can then help us co collect revenue that we so need to drive the change that we're talking about. Well, thank you very much, ladies. We want to take a break now. We'll come back with more questions. Emmanuel Moshumbe, please take us to the break. All right. Kwa mtaza maaji ambuwa kwa pali nyumbani na vile vile pia ambuwa kwa ukumbini. Karika mchezo wote ukiwa moto kidogo, wachezaaji kidogo na rusuwa na chukua break. Kwa hivyo kwa hivyo sasa, tunachukua short commercial break. Tukiregia kama kawida, Eric Latif na Sharon watakuwa kendelea na awamu nyingine. Ye hii debate. Tundi karika break to for that. Welcome back. This is the second part of Miss President, the debate, and it continues. We have our six contestants as we ask the questions. We've received some questions from social media, and we'd like to pose them to you now. The question is, what will you do to ensure that Kenya really means business when it comes to climate justice? What will you do to make sure that Kenya really means business when it comes to climate justice? You understand, of course, this is a very topical question with COP27 co conversations going on in Sharm El Sheikh, Egypt. I'll start with you, Pauline. It's time to unmask this monster of climate change. It's a global concern. So I think we, we start by echoing what our president did say some times back plant your age. So I think all Kenyans have been given an opportunity. That's number one. And then as Kenyans also, because of climate change, we cannot afford to do our business as usual. And that is why we must start investing on other mechanization in terms of handling the climate. That's why we were talking about the drought resistant crops. We don't need to rely on the rains. And again, one of the key areas that I didn't expound on, we have people that are employed in this country known as uh, extension workers, agriculture extension workers. It is time that they took up this responsibility, came back to Kenyans at the local level and teach them because there is what we call soil testing. It is important that right now we don't do business as usual. There's some type of soil that you may not need to plant a particular crop. So I think for me, I want to look at the homegrown solutions and also at the same time, we are aware COP27 is ongoing. We are pleading that as the ones that have represented us are in Egypt, when they come back, can we implement those, those, uh, those solutions that will come from that end? So I think it is time that we unmask this issue of climate change. Thank you. Um, Angel, is that enough? Unmasking, what will you do different? Well, I would further unmask the issue of climate change because we are not the leading emitters of carbon in the world. 
yet we are the ones who are the ones getting the impact of it all. So I think when we talk about uh, planting trees and and having international conversations on environmental conservation, I think we really need to put to task the G7 and the global leaders and the superpowers, because as they are industrializing, as they are manufacturing on and on, they are polluting our environment and, the, and we are the ones who are bearing that cost. So we need to work together as countries of the world to ensure that we can conserve humanity. And one thing we must accept is that we are doing this, and so this is happening. And then, that, then we can start having a conversation. And then again, I think governments need to also ensure that we have credits for those using green energy to ensure that we keep on using green energy. Green energy is pertinent to our, our energy consumption. And once we go into that, then we will be having a better conversation. And then again, we, are, we have about 15% of arable land in Kenya. And as we are looking at that 15%, uh, governments and policies need to encourage people to settle in other areas where there is not much threat to our environment so that we ensure that other places that are arable, other places that are conducive uh, are, are left for that purpose so that we don't put um, a, 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 a jungle of apartments in those places or jungle rocks in those places just because of the forces of demand and supply. And then the other thing we don't really need to have to politicize the climate change issue. It is real. It is happening. People are dying of hunger. The, the heat levels are rising. Our, we are flooding when we should be, when, they, when, when there should be a sunrise, when there should be, when there should be sun. Um, uh, the sun should be su should be shining, and I think there's a lot that we really need to take into consideration when we talk Thank about you, climate Angel. change. It is very important. Thank, Thank you. you. Your time is up. Bina, I want to come to you, and remember, you're talking about what you would do as president to make sure that Kenya is now serious about climate justice. Climate justice is about looking at equitable and fair distribution of dis responsibilities, benefits, and the burden of climate change globally. What would you do to make sure that Kenya is serious and seen to be serious? Um, first of all, we are talking about uh, climate justice uh, in light of the COP27 conference that is currently taking place. And I think as Madam President, I'll be very keen to ensure that we implement the outcomes from COP27 that is currently taking place. And um, number two, I'm very keen to ensure that matters environmental conservation is just not the burden of the Ministry of Environment. This should also be streamlined across all the other ministries. We have to look at the, uh, the Ministry of Mining, how are they contributing to environmental degradation and what can they do about it? I'll expect every ministry to have a plan in terms of how they're managing uh, environmental concerns and contributing to issues to do with climate uh, uh, justice. And also in terms of uh, improving on our forest cover and planting uh, trees. That is very key because uh, our forest cover and our forest are our source of um, water catchment uh, areas. And I think uh, I'll be very keen uh, to ensure that as citizens we also embrace not only planting trees but also not cutting down trees. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bina. Frida, the same question to you. How much more can we do our part as Kenya for climate action? When you talk about climate action, the tree always comes to mind. So in this uh, era when in Kenya the conversation about GMO is so real, I would, I would ensure that as we discuss GMO foods, can we discuss GMO trees so that we are able to bring trees that don't shed leaves so that they are able to maintain a, can a canopy that plays its role in ensuring that we have precipitation in the country. I would also make sure that the many conferences that are held in Kenya and around the globe that are scientific in nature, that the findings that they have are rolled down at the ground so that we don't have conference findings ending up in conference papers and conference books and they're not being implemented at the ground level. Then I would also ensure that all the, all the counties have a climate justice bill or a climate justice policy because in Kenya as, as it is right now, we only have about five counties or less that actually have a climate bill in place in their counties. Then I would also want to second one of my colleagues, uh, Angel, who talked about pol politics. And I also think it is time we held our politicians accountable for the conversations about climate change. And also, as a president, I would ensure that 
I request and I urge the media houses to normalize the conversation of climate change so that it's not a very high profile discussion that the people at the grassroots level who will actually be doing every little thing to contribute to the major goal that they understand what we are talking about when we talk about um, uh, climate. Then also I will be for the idea that we don't continue looking at what the Westerns are doing to give us climate change. What are we doing to address it? Thank you. Nuru, the question comes to you as well. It's about climate justice. Yes, Eric, thank you so much for this opportunity. I wanted to highlight something about climate change that is making it very difficult for Kenya to achieve its goals. And one of the reasons is poverty. People are cutting down trees because they want to make some economic benefit from what the trees can provide. But if we look at it from an economic perspective, what incentive would you give a poor person to ensure that they grow a tree knowing they can take full advantage of what that tree is able to produce? All coastal counties are capable of growing cashew nuts, but how many have cashew nut trees clouding the streets of those coastal counties? Another option is ensuring that all government contracts have a greening component. You'll not build a road, you'll not do a water pan, you'll not do a dam unless you are going to ensure that part of that process, because this, these are projects that take at least a year, part of that process must ensure that when you leave that place, it is very green and the project is done. That's the only time you get to enjoy the pay that comes in terms of the public contract. Another thing is that, because I am a passionate person when it comes to building resilient communities, how are our communities prepared to bounce back? This conversation should be held even at the curriculum level and in our education systems. Children are very good at passing information around. And if we don't take, take advantage of that curriculum to pass information to even the parents, these homes, everybody should take that initiative of knowing the teacher has said, and me as a family we are able to do. Kids will become very proud and will grow more climate conscious community. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Nuru. <laughs> Lastly, on this question, uh, it's to you, Milka. How can Kenya be more serious, uh, be seen to be more serious on climate justice? Uh, we cannot talk about climate action or climate justice without talking about solid waste management. And I'll give an example of my county where 70% of solid waste is actually not collected. So what do we do about it? Uh, so th there needs to be a policy. For example, if I give an example of a, a, a company like Coca-Cola, how much plastic do they actually bring to our shops? You know, the pep sodas. So I need to come up with a policy whereby you need to take care of your waste. If you're producing glass, if you're producing plastic, then you have to find a way of getting back the glass or the plastic back to you the same way you distribute it to our shops in forms of sodas. Uh, water runoff. Uh, we know that every year, okay, rather, it, uh, we've, we've had um, a, a while since it rained. But then when it rains, what do we do with the rainwater? Can we have household water pans? Can we have community water pans? Uh, the other issue that we want to talk about is the use of things like bamboo which is actually very environmental friendly. We can use it for making furniture, we can use it for making so many other things. Can we plant it? It's actually a tree that grows very fast. And the other thing is bringing all the stakeholders together. Uh, like my, uh, my friend Nuru mentioned that, uh, uh, I, I personally would look at it as CSR. If you want to offer CSR, I would look at it like, can 20% of, of your CSR actually go into climate action? So for me, I think those are the policies I, I would um, take up actively as a president. Uh, and use technology like seed bombing to plant trees, because ideally we should have a 10% tree cover in Kenya, but right now we're at about 6%. So we have a long way to go, and we're going to fix our policies through my office. We want to continue with this uh, for a bit and just giving you an extra 30 seconds or 40 seconds each so that you can continue talking about climate justice. Nuru, starting with you, you have a point to add on this, but it's about justice. How do you make the big polluters responsible for their actions and also for what they have uh, done to the not big produce, pr pr uh, polluters as well? Thank you so much. But before I address that question, I wanted to highlight to uh, Ms. President Milka that uh, solid waste management is actually a devolved function for the counties. And what counties are, are grappling with right now is the ability to do the enforcement part of it. Because security is not fully devolved. Counties have a margin that they are only supposed to hire, which most of them have surpassed that uh, employment cap. What are counties supposed to do to ensure that apart from whatever enforcement they are providing, they are able to secure enforcement for solid waste management so that we can keep up collecting this waste. But also, uh, coming back to your question, 
is that when it comes to climate justice, what works for most countries, apart from Kenya, and that they are able to actually consume their carbon credits, is data. And in Kenya, we are very weak at ensuring that we have correct data. We've been able to also interrogate data that comes from our National Bureau of Statistics, and most of it is not up to date with what is happening in the counties. We can improve this by ensuring that we devolve our statistical systems. Counties should be able to have their own data to track what is happening in terms of their environmental capacities Thank you. and uh, climate change right. effects. Uh, Thank your you. time is up. You mentioned uh, Milka, so I'll give her a right of reply in just 30 seconds. Uh, thank you very much. I would like to remind Ms. President Nuru that enforcement in the counties actu is actually not a work of the police service. It's actually a work of the enforcement departments which are actually existent in the counties. I think what the counties are lacking is they're following the mamambogas and these other um, sometimes unnecessary things and forgetting to do the actual enforcement on people like this. How about counties engaging external uh, investors or businesses to actually do solid waste management for them in terms of collection, sorting at source, and even sending it for recycling? So enforcement is not police service, it's department of enforcement, uh, of enforcement in the counties. Thank you. Uh, your time is up. Uh, Bina, on the same uh, subject, a lot of people have questioned the place of the youth in climate justice, in climate action, that we haven't given them the rightful place at the table. As Ms. President, how would you approach this different? Um, I think, um, first of all, we have to acknowledge um, the fact that we have to embrace young people's ideas and innovation and invest in those ideas and innovation. Because if you look at also some of the local organizations and institutions that are trying to respond to climate justice issues are led by young people who don't even have access to finances to drive their innovative projects. So as young people, we bring value to the table, we bring ideas to the table, and as Madam President, I'm looking forward to actually finance those creative ideas that are geared towards addressing climate justice and uh, climate issues. And also, Thank lastly... You, Bina. Thank you, Bina. Okay. In the interest of time, I want to give um, just 40 seconds each to Pauline as well. Pauline, your further comment on this. Yeah, I think I love the issue of bringing the voices on the table. For me, I'll talk about the voices of the women. Women are consumers when it comes to to issues on climate change. And so what is the alternative when we are talking about, about firewood? Because women need that firewood to cook. So would we now start looking at issues of briquettes? And uh, change is expensive. I think somebody challenged our leaders. We must get to the ground and actually make this change, and it will be possible. So when we are talking about climate change, solar. Solar right now is the in thing. But do ke can Kenyans afford that? This is why we've been talking of homegrown solutions, so that we are able, even through chamas, to be able to get these women to get these solars. So we will be having solutions that are workable from the household level, even as we move to the policy level at the national level. Thank you. Right. Uh, fantastic. Uh, Angel? Thank you so much. First of all, I'd like to uh, take it back from Eric, the question you asked on climate justice. I think that is a role that Kenya alone cannot play because when you talk and look at big emitters, the superpowers of the world, then we will not be able to win that fight as a country alone. That is where our regional economic communities come in. That is where the African Union comes in. So that we have a bigger voice as 54 countries to say that we are not the emitters of carbon. So we cannot be the ones solely dealing with climate change. And so we work together as nations to be able to prevent our people from dying, to prevent, fr to prevent our women fr from going through uh, hardships at home because of where they have to get water. I think that's something we need to do as a country collectively. And when you talk about young people not Thank being... You, Angel. Thank okay. you, Angel. Okay. Frida. I want to try and make a one size fit the two issues, the youth issue and the solid waste management. Solid waste management in Kenya is a problem. Even if it's devolved, it looks like our counties are not doing a good job. Uh, when you're talking about solid waste, remember there's also the issue of the medical waste that sometimes is in our neighborhoods. We have the electronics waste. For me, what I would do as president is privatize that sector of solid waste management. And when it becomes a national-wide strategy, it should be able to provide employment for the youth all over the country. Thank you. Right. Thank you. And in the interest of time, we each have you each have one minute to make your closing uh, remarks. I'll start with you, Nuru, and we'll go all the way to the end. One Thank minute. Thank you each. so much, Sharon. I've been on this journey for the past 18 weeks. And uh, one thing that I've learned and I've grown through this process is to tell Kenyans that solutions exist amongst you. 
And as a leader, the best I can offer you is to ensure that I am a leader full of accountability, who's patriotic and who's passionate about building this community. But for it to work, we need to bring back our patriotism. We need all of you to contribute in your small spaces what you can do to ensure that your ideas are also part of our de development agenda. We need to have a plan for poverty alleviation. I've seen China do it for hundreds of millions of people to bring their poverty levels to 20%. And that's not a small country. It's very populous. So if Kenyans are capable of coming together, we can solve these problems. And as Ms. President, if you give me your vote today, you will never be disappointed because that is what I'm driving at and I'm driving to make sure that I leave a legacy behind that is worth of a woman leader in this African nation. Thank you. Bina? Um, I have been at the forefront of, for fighting for inclusion of young people, of women, of persons with disability when it comes to economic empowerment, when it comes to safety in our communities. I work with Chama women who address issues that are actually meant to be addressed by our politicians. I have run for political office before. I have seen firsthand what poverty can do to strip us of our dignity. My experiences at Miss President and at the community in terms of mobilizing and organizing have prepared me to take this country to the next level as Madam President. Thank you very much. Pauline? Thank you. Uh, I speak to Kenyans today that Martin Luther Jr. said that if you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, crawl. Paraphrasing whatever you need to do, you must keep moving forward. This country must move forward. We've just come from an election, and I want to plead with all our leaders, peace should be our word. We are Kenyans. Our tribe is Kenyan. As Miss President, one of the things that I ascribe to is that making this nation better at each day. All the voices matter. And that is why I have worked in service delivery unit. Presidency is about taking the services to the people in a quality, timely manner, value addition. As Miss President, I have what it takes because I know what it means to take service to the people. This evening, I want once again to ask Kenyans to stay in peace. The insecurity levels in this country are wanting. Councillors, the religious leaders, take up this challenge from me as Miss President. Speak to the people. We need Kenya to remain better, if not best. Fantastic. Milka. Uh, thank you very much. I am very glad and elated. I have always had a voice, but Miss President has just amplified that voice. And I know that this applies for the rest um, of uh, the Miss President finalists and for every other woman, for every other child for every other youth out there. Out there. And uh, I think for me right now, my concern is that the biggest issue that we have in Kenya right now is not nepotism, it's not fights between um, two communities or tribes, it's actually the divide between the haves and the haves not, have not. And I think that any government worth its salt is a government that would ensure that every person, every citizen actually lives in dignity. Every citizen is able to do something as basic as at least putting a basic meal on the table. And therefore, I would like to say that as Miss President, I I'm going to push for that agenda of increasing, uh, uh, reducing the inequalities. And of course, I'm not going to be silent on the silent endemic of Thank mental you. health in Thank Kenya. You, Thank, Thank you. you. I believe in the pro prosperity of this country. I believe in the growth of this country. I see potential in every corner in this country, from the youth to the women to the men of this country and the leadership of this country. And uh, today, as I stand here as Miss President, I see that when we look at the media focus on Africa, launching Miss President and putting me alongside brilliant women is something that the Kenyan, Kenyans should see and know and acknowledge. And so I've walked this journey. It has been a, a tough one, full of challenges and tasks, but amazing at the end of it. And so today, as we've walked that journey of 18 weeks, I want to ask you for your vote. To vote, please send ANGEL to 23960. ANGEL to 23960. In my last seconds, I want to give a personal message and eulogize my friend Steve Shege, who died on a road accident um, when he was heading home. And this really speaks a lot to the road accident menace that is in our country. I appeal to government to ensure there is proper infrastructure, and I appeal to Kenyans to ensure that they send each other home Thank and watch ov over each other in their Thank roads. You. Thank, Thank you, you Angel. Uh, Frida. Miss President is here to stay. 
And when I look at all the participants that are on this, in this hall, it affirms what I think and what I believe. So mine is to just ask that you continue embracing us when we come to work with you. Because for me, I am going to normalize the conversations we've had on screen and today to reality. So I want to ask that when you go out there, Go and normalize the conversation about Miss President. I also want to acknowledge our trainers that we are seeing here that have done a good job at preparing us to be Miss President. And I want to let you know that in the near future, look out for a president contestant in Frida in the near future because Miss President has grown leadership in me. I also want to ask all the women to be on the lookout for Miss President and ensure you give media focus a run for their time by applying in large numbers because all women are capable. Otherwise, kumbuka kuvote Frida, dio ima neno ikue ya kawaida, jina iko hapa mbele, and I'll be very glad if you vote me in. Thank, thank you, you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And that's the end of our debate tonight. We want to thank you very much for your passionate presentations. We may now encourage you to shake hands as a sign of goodwill <laughs> and to wish each other well in the next phase. And as they show you camaraderie and, uh, you know, good competition, good spirit of, you know, getting things done, let's give a round of applause to these people again. You know their names, you know their counties, you know their numbers. Now, their future is literally in your hands. You're watching Miss President, season two, and we're looking for the ultimate Miss President. They six in the mix. Now it's up to you to make the right decision. Remember, you're watching the only show on television whereby you never really know. Until you know. And next week, you'll know. <laughs>